dramas are an intergeneric hybridization of the German doku and drama filmer. And recent film media studies have lent a handful of English neologisms to the factional fictional combination, such as dramatic reconstruction, faction, reality-based film, or fact-based drama. I won't delineate between all of these terms and the elements of form they highlight. It's suffice it to say that this cluster of descriptors applies to a category of film and TV productions that puts forth an argument based on recent history. As such, docudrama portrays its fictional elements as realistically as possible, and it relies on its real elements to weave historical significance into the fictional moments. As Eric Paget writes in his investigation into the spate of docudramas within the last 20 years in Europe, the quote, fusion of documentary material with dramatic narrative makes docudrama particularly suited to launch a persuasive argument when its narrative claims warrants the claims from documentary data, unquote. The documentary support that the film is based on fact, not just simply visually recreating it, adds weight to the dramatic argument at the heart of the film. Schlake acknowledges the persuasive aim of his film, stating that he wanted to give a voice to the voiceless Automo and to show the filmgoer the man behind the headlines. In essence, the director filmed the docudrama to give a counterargument to the media's accounts of Automo as the violent foreigner. Furthermore, by claiming that he's, quote, giving a voice, Schlake suggests that he supplies his audience with a realistic portrayal of the black experience. In this attempt, he's not alone. Many docudramas have sought to influence public opinion and attitudes surrounding civil disobedience, um, black pride, and politics. Taking American film history as a complementary example, we don't have to look further than the television series Roots or The People vs. O.J. Simpson, or in film Malcolm X and recently Selma. However, and this is important to note, that unlike Otomo, each of these productions were directed and written in part by black Americans. Their social critiques given, to use Spivak's terms, as subaltern speaking instead of people being spoken for. Within German film history, social and political analysis of the past generally was a central motivation of new German cinema, that group of provocative experimental filmmakers in their films spanning the late 1960s to the early 1980s. As Angelico Winner astutely points out, these forebears to Otomo quote, events the personal and the political, offering substantial social and political critique against the status quo. It is no accident that Ottomo recalls so many of these images and the earlier social realist dramas. By redoubling these images and narrative themes, Schlake continues the new German cinema project of challenging social assumptions. In fact, making visual and narrative allusions to films by directors like Rainer Werner Fassbender and Volker Schlundorf. Schlake's fictional edition of romance between Ottomo and Gisela recalls Rainer Werner Fassbender's Ali Fear Eats the Soul. In that earlier film, an unlikely romance blossoms between Emmy and Ali, also a white German and a foreign-born man. This reliance on realistic, common-sense images and the employment of well-known, though socially provocative narratives lends the film, Automo, a degree of acceptability and persuasiveness. The viewer is invited to accept the argument that these recreations warrant. And the notion of warrant is um, particularly helpful here, since a warrant locates its basis in, the, in common knowledge or common sense one that allows Schlake's argument to make the necessary shift from the journalistic fact to sympathetic recognition. So then what, what is Schlake's argument about Friedrich Otomo, and is it undermined by his own directorial choices? Finally, how does the narrative of Otomo as both a factual person and a fictional subject lend insight into Schlake's view that blackness is something to solve like a puzzle? First, I will look at the film itself to identify the ways which Schlake introduces Otomo and the visual strategies he employs to develop him as a figure of interest. Then I will comment on the film's narrative structures that are central to the docudrama's arguments. We meet Otomo first in his room at the Caritas home. Just before 4 a.m., he lights a candle and he begins to wake. His face enters the frame, following a shot of a poster on the wall. The poster is a black and white photograph of a Bell 105 helicopter hovering over a desert. This Bell 105 helicopter model was used by the German and French Air Forces in foreign missions following World War II. Otomo's first appearance then in the film is juxtaposed with a reminder of the military. As he wakes daily, Otomo's eyes first take in this helicopter flying over bare earth, an emblem of war, of what, have, what might have been his former home in West Africa, as well as a reminder that the country of his current residence, Germany, participated in those wars. While the available details of Otomo's life aren't many, immigration records show that he arrived in Germany from France after seeking asylum from Ghana and Cameroon. In his asylum application, Otomo claimed that his grandfather fought with the German army in Cameroon and that his great-grandparents were slaves under the German regime. One of a number of former German colonies, Cameroon had German troops occupy the nation until 1915. 
His lack of permanent residence then was caused by Imperial Germany's in interference and West Germany's unwillingness to grant him a work permit. By introducing Ottomo in relation to the military and the African landscape, Schlake establishes that Friedrich Ottomo is primarily defined and displaced by the effects of colonialization. While this contextualization of the protagonist's arrival and situation in Germany shows the ways in which the colonizer-colonized relationship is not dissolved once occupation ends, and that these national relationships have an indelible effect on the experience of being black in Europe, Schlick's visual treatment of Ottomo undermines his awareness of the colonial subject's situation. In fact, by focusing on Ottomo's black body, Schlick makes his film subject akin to a specimen or consumable object and repeats through his visual language the discourse found in newspapers following Ottomo's death. In introducing Ottomo, Schlake focuses extensively on his body and includes shots that further a narrative about black masculinity and serve to sexualize him. After he wakes, the film cuts to Ottomo's large hands and feet as he casts conch shells onto the floor of his room. Foregrounded, his hands and feet seem larger than life, and at times they occupy the entire frame, or nearly the entire frame. Schlake, um, next, Schlake films Ottomo performing calisthenics. Here, the camera is positioned adjacent to his body, pointing directly at him taking in his torso and muscular forearms. Ottomo rises and falls before the viewer as he does push-ups. We are inches away from his head, and we take in his breathing. This intimate introduction to Ottomo's body continues a few moments later as the camera, and by extension the viewer, joins him in the shower. While Ottomo showers, he moves under the water flow to rinse soap from his body, turning so that we see the entirety of his shoulders and torso. His musculature is unmissable. Later in the film, when the police who search for Ottomo Oh, excuse me, later in the film, the police who search for Ottomo also remark on his size and strength, with one stating that he was so gross wie ein Tier, as big as an animal. This language about Ottomo's body harkens back to the German Volkerschauen at the beginning of the 20th century, when Germans placed Africans on displays in zoos. The same type of objectifying, dehumanizing language was taken up by the media outside of the film, even at the time of the film. Even later in an interview with Schlake about his project, one, an interviewer inserts that Ottomo war ein Kerl mit Muskeln, gut gebaut, contrasting him in his potency to the smaller frame Schlake. The focus of the, bo of the body of black men is not a new phenomenon in German society. In his book, Hypersexuality and Headscarves, Domani Partridge traces the long history of sexualized black men in Germany in general, and in German film in particular. He argues that the both fictional and real life encounters with black men, especially sexualized ones, provided a way for white Germans to participate in the colonial imaginary, to consume the exotic. In Domani's words, quote, black men came to index foreign adventure and were linked to the expanded possibilities of consumption. By highlighting Ottomo's colonial background and physicality, especially at the film's outset when viewers are introduced to what defines Ottomo in private, Schlake underscores his subject as someone, or perhaps something, exotic, attractive, desirable. Returning to Partridge's point that black men was something to be consumed, it is worth noting that consumption became a form of political legitimacy for the newly re reunified Germany. By progressing with the capitalist economic model, Germany after the West and East division put a premium on expanding its access to global consumer goods. While Ottomo's death occurred in 1989, the film's production took place in the economic conditions of the late 1990s in Germany. In that respect, for Ottomo as a feature film to perform well economically, it needed to be viewed, and by extension, to meet market demands. And one way to do this was to put the exotic body of Ottomo front and center. Schlake pursues his anti-racist argument all while dehumanizing his subject. Though he contends that Ottomo was more than a murderer who stabbed police officers, he makes his argument by placing the value in his body, by highlighting his physical attractiveness more than in Ottomo as a person. It is in the docudrama's fictive narrative where Schlake's argument for racial acceptance most clearly falls flat. After Ottomo shoves the subway conductor in their disagreement, he searches for a way to exit Stuttgart before he can be apprehended by the police. In one of the city's shipping hubs, he finds a truck driver willing to take him across the border to The Hague, naturally for a price. And of course, Ottomo does not have his asking fee, so he's left to search the city for someone willing to give him the 400 mark bribe. In a search, he happens upon Gazela and her granddaughter, friends them, and is even invited up to the apartment of Gazella's daughter. Over conversation and dancing, African dancing no less, the two find mutual admiration and understanding. And in a moment of joy while they dance, Gazella even imagines that she introduces him to her friends and they all go to Africa together. Gazella agrees to give him the money, and in a moment before he must escape from the police to attract him down to the apartment building, Otomo and Gazella share a passionate kiss.
sorry, we missed the, the shower slide. The film's romance seems to establish an alternative to the real existing race relations during the time of Otomo's death. Otomo's situation appears that he can either be the object of police oppression or a love interest for a German woman. The film repeats the romantic theme of a white German woman and a black man finding one another, as in Fassbender's um, Marriage of Maria Brown, or Ali, Fear Eats the Soul, by drawing on, uh, drawing on familiar images to reinforce the possibility of sympathetic understanding. Yet, unlike those earlier social realist films, the genre of docudrama, with its insistence on the fictive elements holding the same merit as its fast paced details um, for advancing an argument, limits the opportunity of character development. In Fassbender's films, we are privy to the challenges specific to the relationships between women and men, not merely the external social pressures. For example, in Ali, uh, Fear Eats the Soul, we see Emmy's um, anxieties surrounding Ali's loyalty begin to corrode their earlier easy rapport. In Schlage's film, however, the romance is limited to quick sympathy and a flash of sexual intrigue. That Gazela enjoys African dance and music only reinforces how superficial their interests and experience are. As a consequence, the, fil the figures of Otomo and Gazela become flattened and act symbolically, representing foreignness, or perhaps blackness, and Germanness. That Gazela barely knows Otomo, yet is drawn to him sexually, whether as herself or as a stand-in for greater white Germany, once again renders Otomo as a desired foreign object. If, as Schlage states, Friedrich Otomo offers an opportunity to explore blackness, to quote, solve the black puzzle, his film on the subject does not achieve either. Though it does offer an untold story and an, interrogative, an alternative to the narrative in the media that Otomo was a dangerous foreigner, its insistence on foregrounding Otomo's physical qualities as well as its inventive love story undoes the possibilities for nuanced understanding within the film's narrative of what it means to be black in Germany. Instead, the film says more about white perceptions of blackness. In Schlage's film, for Otomo to be a compelling protagonist, we have a connection with German. We have to have a connection with German. Indeed, um, the first time that uh, Otomo is in a German's home is when Gisela invites him into his daughter's or her in daughter's um, apartment, and he thus needs to be sexually attractive to a white German woman. Likewise, though the film is based on fact within its docudrama framework, it's based only on one type of fact that's applied at the institutional level, such as the police. Um, criminal report or from the immigration office. Formally, the marriage of fictive and non-fictive modes holds the potential for a complex new and portrait of Otomo's experience with contribution given for black scholars, directors, screenwriters of color, or interviews and input from other immigrants and asylum seekers. But Schlake accepted the white German experience as the only reality and created a film that insisted that viewers do the same. In the end, silencing Otomo, the very person he'd hoped to give voice to. Thank you. revisiting that film after many years. Um, our second speaker is uh, Kaolin Nagrabi. And um, Kaolin uh, studied um, at the Ruprecht Karls University in Heidelberg from 1999 until 2005, obtained an MA degree um, in, uh, in German and English, uh, af and after living and acquiring her first experiences as a teacher in San Sebastian, Spain, returned to Heidelberg and um, passed her first state exam in 2007. And she entered teacher's training um, in middle and high school in Ulm, Germany, worked there as a German and English teacher until 2015. Um, she then moved to Canada um, and um, is now, um, she has a, a two-year-old uh, son um, and uh, has enrolled as of a year ago uh, in the MA program in Germanic Languages and Literatures here at the University of Toronto, um, and is starting her PhD this fall. Uh, and I would like to add, um, we're very grateful for Caroline for, uh, Caroline for um, joining our panel. Um, we had a cancellation a couple of weeks ago, and we're scrambling for a replacement, and um, she has very, very generously stepped in uh, in the last minute. Um, Caroline was a um, student in a graduate seminar of mine this um, this winter, what we call winter, which I suppose you think is spring, um, <laughs> um, and we actually screened Sherry Hagen's film in that class, and she wrote her final paper on that film. So she was kind of 
time to discuss it, and it just seemed like a wonderful way to continue that conversation. So thank you, Colleen, for the courage to sort of in the last minute um, um, bump up your paper for a public audience. Ida's is yours, so Ida's is yours. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah. yes, I have a copy. Um, it should be called um, Intersection. Ah, there it is. Ah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, yes, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, as Angelica uh, Fenna has mentioned, um, I wrote a sequence analysis about um, Often Sight and Blick at Second Glance and also my final paper about it. Um, but for this uh, presentation, I uh, had to change my focus a bit and I worked the last two weeks uh, on this to, um, to be able to present um, inter the, uh, the theory of intersectionality and uh, music in Often Sight and Blick um, or uh, at second glance, in my in my paper, I was um, more focusing on at uh, second glance, uh, at second glance with the film, um, the German film Beyond the Silence. Um, but for this um, paper, as I said, I've changed the focus a bit, and I want to first uh, start by saying why I've uh, chosen to expand on the theory of intersectionality um, for the paper. Um, that we that I had to write, we were reading um, literature and. And um, I found this quote by Rosemary Garland Thompson. Um, she said in one of her um, essays that integrating uh, disability into feminist uh, theory is generative, broadening our collective inquiries, questioning our assumptions, and contributing to feminism's intersectionality. And I had never heard this term before, so I got interested, and I was um, doing more research about it. And um, so I first want to start saying a by saying a few words about the theory of intersectionality and then later um, continue um, talking more about the film and how I think those two um, terms um, interrelate with each other. So the term um, intersectionality was first introduced by Kimberly Kershaw in her, um, in her um, essays, Demarginalize Demarginalization, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex in 1989 and later was further refined in 1991 in her essay, Mapping the Margins. And in those essays, Kershaw exposed the logics which work behind marginalization that are at work within institutionalized discourses to, legit legitima to legitimize power relations. And um, so the term was first more used to explain, especially um, black American female experiences that experienced uh, discrimination um, a lot. And, um, but since the beginning of intersectionality, it has traveled a lot also internationally and has been also adopted by other disciplines. Um, and so uh, we can say that the black female experience maybe was a jumping off point, but so far um, up to this point, um, intersectionality has been further explored um, in the way of exploring other intersections such as the intersection of race and sexuality or lately also race and disability. Al although Alfredo Artal, for example, argues in one of his essays that especially the intersection of race and dis disability has been rather slow in the academic discourse. Um, and um, interestingly enough, um, I think oh, I was really intrigued by this theory because um, especially um, Often Spite and Blick at Second Glance by Sherry Hagen um, portrays characters that all face at least one marginalizing intersectionality, intersection uh, either race, disability, or um, homosexuality, or some even face more than one. Um, so, doesn't always work. So, for example, I think everybody has seen the film, so I probably don't need to elaborate too much on all the characters. But, for example, Kai Hat Sprung, the uh, protagonist, one could say that she is, first of all, I mean, she's a black German, she's female, and she has turned blind. So, she 
she's facing, she's confronted with re-marginalizing intersectional identities. Uh, Falk and Carla Richter, they um, have a black German uh, background. Um, Elena, the therapist, she is German, but she's going blind, so she's um, she will s probably soon be faced with a visual impairment. Well, she's already um, confronted with a visual impairment, but probably going to be completely blind that she really struggles with. Benjamin has been blind all his life. Uh, Till and Ante Bella. Um, Till is a black German and he is homosexual, but he has, um, up until a point in the film at least, also uh, was hiding from uh, society. And one could ask oneself, for example, why he hasn't been able to live up to his homosexuality. As for example, uh, Elena's colleague, uh, who also is homosexual, but he seems to be more open about it. Um, and Pan, the piano tuner, as we know, he also has a visual impairment. Um, and there's also Uncle Ulf, um, who is um, of black German background as well. Um, so when I was uh, reading more about oops, um, intersectionality, I found a paper by um, Valerie Purdy Barnes and um, Eibach. That, that is talking about intersectional invisibility. And I, I was kind of intrigued and thought invisibility with a film that deals with um, blindness. Um, probably maybe there I can find some common ground or some interesting things to compare. And um, so um, in when, when Barnes and Eibach introduced their, their model of um, intersectional invisibility in 2008, they wanted to move beyond the question of um, which group is worse off that has often been asked in uh, academic discourse by either the adv advocates of the double, double jeopardy model that say if you have more than one uh, marginalizing intersectional identity, um, oppression sort of like accumulates, you will experience more oppression or discrimination and the opposing view that prototypical members of a subordinate group actually experience more discrimination or oppression than ones that actually do not fit this proto prototypical um, subordinate group um, identity. So, um, um, oops, now I think. Yeah, and um, in this model, they um, Eibach and Wan said that they wanted to get beyond this question of always asking like which uh, question is worse off, and they wanted to just specify the distinct forms of oppression that are experienced by those with intersectioning subordinate identities, and by drawing on dominant ideologies such as androcentrism and ethnocentrism and heterocentrism, the model of intersectional di invisibility explains why non-prototypical members of a social group can experience what they call, call social in invisibility, so become more or less like social socially invisible to the group that they belong to. I mean, this is, a, this is a theory, and they also say that it's very limited. They know that it's, they themselves, the authors know that it's a limited uh, theory. Um, but I still thought it was, it's very interesting with respect to the film, because um, they say, for example, this social invisibility can entail some advantages and disadvantages. One advantage would be, as I mentioned before, that usually the non, uh, the, the most prototypical members of a subordinate group will, will receive or be confronted with the most oppression or most discrimination. But disadvantages, of course, that is that your, um, that historically, culturally, legally, and politically, um, the social invisibility will lead to members of um, this group not really being heard in discourse. So, um, and I think it's interesting in the fact because, uh, for example, we could ask ourselves in, for example, in the case of uh, Till Bella, for example, he's, he's black, German, and gay. So one could ask um, oneself, for example, when when one is also gay, is it then does la this, does race become less important then? As would be um, would be maybe the theory of the intersectional invisibility. I'm not saying I'm not 
really being able to answer this question myself because it's not my speciality. I've just worked on it the last week, but I think it's interesting questions to maybe ask ourselves. Um, now let's move on. Oh, sorry. To uh, blindness and color blindness, invisibility, and often sight and blip. So um, there's um, Olivia Landry also has written a very interesting article about the film, and she says that um, in the film, Alfred Sight and Blake, the, the blindness of the, um, of the main protagonist, or maybe even of all protagonists, the um, visual impairment can probably be associated to the concept of colorblindness, and I think this was also mentioned by Sherry Hagen herself in after the screening on Wednesday. So, um, so um, so um, and especially disability and also in this case blindness in film can often be used or has often been used as a narrative metaphor. And so um, I think it probably is true also to d in this film that the notion of color blindness can be seen as what uh, Fatima El Tayeb has called an active form of suppression in the European context, as it acts as a form of discrimination and negates identity and is therefore as damaging as racism. Um, and I guess in this context, the choice of um, blindness can probably be read as a deliberate choice of a predominantly black German cast as addressing first the problem that black, black actors are missing uh, largely in German cinema, or they only fulfill the stereotypical roles, but also maybe bringing into focus the black German community in Germany, which doesn't receive as much attention as a minority group as others maybe. And uh, many um, scholars, also Fatima El Faya, for example, has in European others addressed this problem that uh, especially the black German community um, in Germany does is largely overlooked. So I think it's probably um, an, an answer to, to this lack of um, attention, um, also in film and on a societal level in general. Um, but blindness is always linked to light or sight. Uh, this is also mentioned by Olivia Landry, and um, also in a sense of that light can represent knowledge and so that in that way blindness could be seen as a as a elaborate um, as a um, as a choice of not knowing and in that way it can be associated to what Striva calls um, epistemic violence of colonialism and I and I found this uh, associ association of blindness and light also to be represented in the film for example um, I have a screenshot, this is just shortly before the accident, and then the screen turns all kind of like very bright, which could be from the lights of a car that probably crashes into the car, but I still thought it w in, this, um, in this respect of the association of blindness and, and too much light, we also say people are, Oedipus was blinded by light too, that there is probably a connection. So here in this screenshot, the screen turns all white, after this, oh, I don't know why it's the wrong way. Up. Oh, sorry. Um, after the um, accident and the impact, also the screen tur turns all white, which um, also refers to this idea of milky whiteness that I will later um, refer to again. And after this, after the opening sequence, then we see uh, the main character Kai, and now here she is blind. And she, and then when she goes through the entrance door at the main station, I kind of notice that it's everything is really bright and light in the background again too, almost like um, it's it, like the lightness kind of hits you again. So I think there's probably an argument to be made that uh, blindness in the film is also associated maybe with light and knowledge, but maybe in the, in the sense of that Europe with his politics of whiteness, not really overlooking the black community that there's one could know about the situation, but maybe one has actively chosen not to in the form of uh, color blindness. Um, yeah, and also um, in the film, 
there's also the viewers constantly asked to readjust uh, his or her vision and to literally, as the title suggests, take a second glance. So we have lots of blurry shots that after a while become more um, not blurry, like more, um, what's the word? Clear, yeah, sorry, more clear. Um, and also there's many situations in the film where also your the viewer's expectations are uh, challenged and where one has to readjust sort of his or her gaze and actually find out that things maybe are not as they appear at first glance. So for example, when we have the first, um, when we have the first scene uh, where Elena meets Pia, um, Pia is extending her hand and Elena is not taking it and one could interpret this as, oh, like maybe she's racist, maybe she's not accepting the hand because Pia is black, but then we learn that actually Elena can't see. And then you know that, yeah, actually maybe you're wrong, your first impression could have been wrong. And also in the scene um, here, the, the, the scene here is taken from the taxi, the taxi ride kind of like going bad. And I took this scene because um, Kai here says that a Falk is a stalker because she has the impression, impression she's been, he, is, he has been stalking her because he's called her up. But later she also learns that actually her assumption was wrong. He's not a stalker, he actually has really good intentions and he is like her chance to be, provides a chance for her to be happy again. Um, and also here um, with Elena and uh, Benjamin, I chose this screenshot too because also Elena is a therapist, so you would think like she's a therapist, she can help people. But in this film, for example, she's the one who needs help. So also your, your first impression is challenged here because she has not been really able to help anyone. She hasn't been able to help Pia, she hasn't been able to help Benjamin, and it's more Benjamin who's the therapist in this relationship. So the kind of the roles are reversed. So I think also we are asked here again to readjust our gaze and our interpretations. And also I took this, um, this screenshot of Till, um, this is when he was um, getting a currywurst and the currywurst person was talking badly about homosex ho homosexuals. And um, yeah, and he was talking to, to Till, probably not assuming at all that he could be actually also talking to a person who is gay himself. So this also shows us that people don't always have the same idea about people, uh, the, the right idea about people. And yeah, one could ask ourselves, why does he, why does he not associate Till with maybe possibly being gay? Why does he like outspokenly say um, homosexual things to, to him? Because maybe it has never occurred his mind. Um, okay, then there's uh, the, the, oh, oh, okay, oh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, there's also the light motif of mostly whiteness in the film that I've already mentioned. Oh, I'm almost out of time. Maybe I should, um, maybe I should, just skip this, uh, some slides and well, the milky whiteness, maybe just to um, sum up, it has also been uh, associated to this milky whiteness of maybe like being a metaphor, a metonymy for color blindness of this politics of um, seeing everything from a white perspective, especially in Germany and Europe. So this has been seen as a, a leitmotif too. There's also the leitmotif of the car accident and maybe just uh, talking about the car accident, um, the car accident is also a traumatic experience for uh, Kai and it recurs again and again in the film. And especially with regards to the car accident as being a traumatic um, experience, I got interested also in the, in the topic of music and especially jazz because jazz in, um, there's a dissertation by uh, Singleton that relates jazz music to trauma and especially Kai, she's, She's experienced trauma, but she also works as a jazz radio station. So I've been wondering if there's an association there to be made. Also Falk, he must have experienced trauma too because his wife has died and he listens to the jazz radio station too. I mean, maybe just because he likes the voice as you suggested on Wednesday, but I mean, he must have at some point listened to the radio station in general, otherwise he wouldn't have dis discovered the voice. So I was wondering if there is um, maybe an association. Yeah, so I wanted to expand a little bit on the leitmotif of a rose is still a rose that is um, a leitmotif in the, so in, the, in the movie. 
but also as jazz and trauma because music has been called the universal language and especially in African American and also um, generally African diasporic um, discourses, music has often been mentioned as the vehicle or the voice that has been used to express what is maybe difficult to express just in language. And music has always been maybe considered as a vehicle that can express things that you cannot express with words. In, in, the, in the dissertation by Singleton, she also refers to um, a philosopher that had a traumatic experience of assault, sexual assault, and she said she couldn't, she couldn't speak about it for years, she could only sing. So I was really interested in also the connection of music and, and topics of the film. But I think I've run out of time, right? Yeah, so. Okay. Can we sit here? Okay. Mike? Thank you, both of you for, thank you to both of you for your papers. Um, it's wonderful also to have a chance to revisit a Sherry Hawkins' film, also with director present, because I felt uh, we could have easily continued our conversation on Wednesday evening, and now we have a chance to do so. Um, I wonder. I'm, I have some thoughts myself, but I'm just. I'm wondering if anyone in the audience wants to to begin um, and has any particular comments to either papers that you'd like to direct to the speakers. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start with a, um, just a, it's a kind of a combination question comment. I don't quite know how to frame it. Um, relating to um, your paper, and um, it was interesting for me to think about this film again. Um, uh, and what, what was striking me was, um, you know, Isaac de, Ban de Bancoli is, um, he's really a, a global actor. Um, he's appeared in, in global art cinema, in Jim Jarmusch's Night in Fog. Um, uh, one of the James Bond films, ca um, Casino Royale, I think it's called, um, in uh, Lars von Trier's Mandalay. Um, so he has a certain kind of global recognition, and um, of course, as, as does um, um, uh, Eva Matas, uh, for different reasons. So Eva Matas sort of becomes an icon for the new German cinema, and Isaac de Bancoli, I mean, what is he an icon for? I mean, he's for global art cinema, but especially of the 90s. Uh, which is a different era, so I almost feel as if there's something about the matching of these two actors that also brings with it um, two histories or two kind of um, moments in um, international cinema. Um, and I, w what struck me with De Bancoli here also is that um, he's he's very iconic. I mean, uh, uh, as is the case with many stars. I mean, you think of someone like Tom Cruise when they're playing a role. They're not just playing the role, but you're always aware also that it is Tom Cruise. Um, and then there are other actors who, when they per perform a role, they sort of disappear into the role. And, they, uh, and I just wondered if you've thought about questions of performance um, in, in your project. I think um, questions of performance are central to the film, especially with um, the ways that a single um, individual has to carry so much representation. So, uh, for example, Isaac de Bancola's, his, his appearance is, it, it, it very much does stand out in a, in a vast majority of um, the film reviews about Autumn Rowe. His appearance is remarked on for his, um, his, his ability to, or his cheekbones, his facial structure, his, his stature, but also his, the, the way that um, 
he's able as the character Otomo to kind of fade away into his physicality. So f for much of the film, uh, when Otomo is in frame, his eyes are to the side or he's not looking um, his interlocutor directly on. And in that way, I think um, while he is a very recognizable actor, uh, he, um, Isaac Yubankola kind of disappears, he falls away and he's um, maybe not as iconic in this role as he has in others, especially like in Casino Royale. Eva Matas, um, as, you, as you mentioned, because of her um, central role in New German cinema, I think was a, maybe a popular draw. And um, she also is, is so representative of the, the 68ers. So her performance in the film was in some ways to just to represent um, this broader generation. And with that, she embodies a, um, a free-spiritedness. She, um, as part of her gazera, as part of her story, as her background in, in the film, she talks about being constantly mobile, constantly moving, being open to um, moving throughout Germany, not necessarily situated in one place, and also uh, lamenting the loss of certain values that maybe were um, more in discussion during the 68 period. So I think in that way, the, the um, performances are representative both of, um, as you mentioned, the global cinema, but also the characters themselves. So uh, Otomo being, or sorry, Isaac Tibancola being um, able to both be recognizable, but also with his acting um, ability to, to fall away into character, and um, Eva Matos as Gisela being um, a audience draw, but also representative of, of this larger argument that Peter Schlake wanted to make. This question is for uh, Carolyn. First of all, thank you so much for sharing. That was that's no small feat to take something from a, um, a scene analysis to a paper. And I think the question of looking at uh, often Zweiten Blick through intersectionality is a, a really good one. And so along those lines, uh, um, I'm glad you reminded us that there's two articles from Kimberly Crenshaw, because I don't remember exactly where this is, but where she explains that this metaphor, this picture of intersectionality, that uh, there is uh, to imagine a cellar or a basement with a trap door and uh, different people are standing on the shoulders of each other person. So the idea would be that a white woman would be at the top and then she's standing on the shoulders of maybe a black woman and she's standing on the shoulders of a black queer woman. And so mm -hmm. to imagine this and how can you climb up to get through that trap door, right? So this is, I think, a, a very interesting visual. And, uh, and to me, it, it's talking, if we think about that cinematically, uh, w the question is what would that look like or feel like or sound like, um, this idea of this type of layering. I wonder if we could, think through, if you decide to take this project further, I'm thinking of Sherry Hadden's film, Intersectionality, um, if there are scenes where we are feeling or seeing that, um, the one that she mentioned with, I think directly at the beginning, there's there's sort of like a screen that we're looking through. It feels like that might be the start of something, but um, I'm sure you've watched the film many times. You can mm -hmm. think through maybe with us another instance of where we could be experiencing a, a cinematic uh, representation of intersectionality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, especially with respect to intersectionality, and I mean, um, if we take the model of intersectional I invisibility, also um, if we have that in mind saying that, yeah, because it, the, if y you become socially invisible, then you also, you will not be heard. And I think especially with respect to that, it was a little bit of shame I couldn't expand on the music topic further, but I think especially this is why music is so important, because through music you can make yourself heard if no one wants. And I think this is why music has also been the a vehicle that has been used in the black community over such a long time, because you can make yourself, ex you can express yourself through music, and you can say, like, look, I'm here, like, why don't you see me? I think this is why. Actually, also, the music is so important for the film. I, I had a thought watching um, Up in Zweiten Blick, and um, it's maybe in 
interesting way to contrast the two films. I was thinking, um, though, invisibility is a theme. In fact, uh, people with disabled people are represented to a higher proportion in the film, obviously, than actually is the case in Germany. And also black Germans are represented too. It, it, it's, uh, though not everybody's black in the film, it's, it's such a comfortably black world. So many of the characters are black Germans. And so I, I thought that was possibly a little, um, a little sort of reverse metaphor for um, and the commenting on um, the actual situation in Germany where neither of these groups is really present to the degree that they might be. Yeah, I feel in that regard it is, there, I th there's a utopian element in the, in the film in the sense of a positive model to work toward. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't. Looking towards the back. Um, so we have in the front here. Oh, you don't. Oh, not yet. Okay, later. <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> I have to, re um, to react to that now because I'm Sherry Hagen. I'm the director of the film we were just talking about. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And um, I think it's not Ethiopian because... Um, all these, I'm not sure if everyone watched the film, but he, he, people who watched the film, all the figures, all the characters I showed, or I'm talking about, they all exist in the reality. And, um, and I wanted to show because um, me as a filmmaker, I'm always interested in, in finding stories um, um, who are able to find um, 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 a connection on a humanity equal, equal um, and, and and that's my motivation. So I, I wanted to come away because, um, just like Fatima also said, because in, um, invisibility, it's really a, a progress of suppression, of keeping others out. And, um, and, it's, and I wanted to show, because we never see in German films and, and on German television, we hardly see people of color in, not in stereotypes roles just in everyday life. And so I was interested in the, in the everyday life because I see these people on street, but I hardly see them on screen. So my intention was just showing a, a everyday life story, which I can see, and also be a part of role model for others because we also have generations, which means we have got children, just like this kid is sitting in here, and this kid is just growing up with um, white images. And, and, and we have to be careful what, how we want to shape the society, and 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 if you're only kind of way telling one single story, which means we only have receiving one, um, we are limiting our our thinking and our and, and our our yeah our thoughts. So that's why um, it's not in Ethiopia; it's reality. <laughs> I've been trying not to say anything, but. When you are, you spend 45 years of your life in a community where your, your student population is deaf, hard of hearing, and over time you see how having no voice turns into an empowering voice, and how the language in and of itself holds the community together and then begins to spread. The study abroad program of my students taking them to come together with deaf Germans. Deaf Germans who, at the time, were limited in terms of where people thought, including parents and the educational system, was going to allow them then the opportunities that they saw in the students that came from our university, who then were not only in a university, in a college, but were studying all the varieties of things that hearing students study. And the surprise, the excitement, and sometimes the dismay that came from the fact that this was not something that was going on in Germany. 
The idea of captioning, for example, was in the states becoming um, of age. And there was lots to learn, open captioning first and then closed captioning, very different from subtitling. To be able to bridge the gaps of what's going on in what was going on at Gallaudet in this regard, uh, the connections we made with the Center of Studies for Linguistics in AS and American Sign Language and so forth um, was in Hamburg, although Hamburg was not exactly where it wasn't the, the seat of where we stayed. I say this to say that it is also a campus of multi, multi um, disabilities. And so the idea of intersectionality where you have an institution that actually speaks to internationally to one disability in particular, then has to also learn how to open itself up to respond to those who come with other disabilities. There is a very interesting program, a deaf-blind program. And how would, in fact, a deaf, a deaf and blind person be communicated with? With the advent of the law that said you must have interpreters, there is the interpreting that occurs in the hand of the blind person. The blind person then also can sign, signs back what he or she has gotten from the interpretation through the touch and the use of sign language in their hand. If you can imagine that, it then takes it to a very different level, the level of the, the inner, the emotional, the sensitivity, the senses. So that person and the one who is actually giving the communication, the person who's, who translates, the person who interprets, then wears a different hat and also has a different feel. They can be uh, detached because they have to be the communicator. At the same time, however, when they want to actually interact, they have to take off that hat and they have to state, I am now no longer that person. Now I am the person who is actually interacting as myself. So this film spoke to me in a very interesting way. Because if I were to take that into a classroom or on the campus to show it, it would resonate very differently because we're talking with people who come from a place of disability, but who have been spending a great and enormous amount of their time overcoming all of that. So to see the people on the screen who are doing exactly the same, living their lives as they live their lives, and wanting help or not wanting help, um, the person who is able to understanding it or not understanding it, it's a so what. It's I am who I am, and this is how I am interacting in the world. And I think the message that, that Sherry's film, that the film brings, is that we all are living this life in a way that means we aren't all able to do everything. And so we have to take people where they are, they empower themselves, and we have to be willing to listen. For the deaf, they're listening through their eyes. For the blind, they're listening to the senses, all the other senses around them. And the communication happens in that way. So the film is very powerful. It's very powerful because of its intersectionality that also brings in other aspects of the, the, the communities and, and uh, uh, gender orientation. All of those things are part of society. And they all, they all appear on our campus and they all appear with people who have disabilities. So I applaud the film for in, in that way because it, it really has a very broad uh, use across uh, disabilities and across those of us who are able. I think maybe, oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, um, thank you both for these great presentations. I was thinking, Beth Ann, about your uh, discussion of Otomo, and are there other films that have been like that? And I hope I'm not asking you to repeat yourself, but you know, is that did that become almost probably not a genre because there wouldn't have been enough films about black people in Germany in the last 15 years, right? But this was in 2000, right? Is that when the film was made? So I'm just wondering if there are other films that take on that 
characteristic, those characteristics, both in terms of the docudrama style, but also this, you know, kind of pitying, tragic <laughs> black person in Germany, which may be a bigger, that's my term, that's how I'm reading it anyway. Um, but just wondering if you can comment on other films that came after Otomo that might have been similar or maybe different in some ways. Yeah, um, in terms of docudrama, it, it was a quite popular genre around that time. And, but I, from my research, I'm not aware of another one that focused so intensively on um, a person of color or, or black German. Um, however, uh, the, the idea, especially of the sympathizing white um, audience or the sympathizing um, white interactor with um, uh, a person of color or a black German or um, someone with a Migrationshintergrund, um, it, uh, there's a recent example, which is called Coleman by Dean Hopkins. Um, uh, somewhat popular uh, German film, another uh, another feature film where um, a uh, immigrant is welcomed by a German family, and they, in the process of having this um, person in their home, learn and have this revelatory understanding of suddenly um, the differences of race, and it, it's it's very much paints the portrait of. Um, like a sympathetic understanding of this poor background, and then the either, I don't want to go so far as saying a white savior, but some uh, a sympathetic and coming up, not coming alongside, but like a welcoming and um, uh, kind of a reductive view of, of that process. Again, it's from the white perspective. So, and I, I do think within the last five years, especially with the the, the quote unquote migrations crisis, the crisis, right? Um, that this has become more of a trope. Um, but around 2000, 1999, I'm not aware of other films that are like this. It would be worth looking into, and I think um, the idea of um, a film that marries fact with fiction is is always, especially when talking about another perspective, it's, it's always a, it's a difficult thing to, to manage, and I'm sure there are other examples, and, and possibly also in East Germany, which I haven't looked into as well um, from the 1989 through the year before. Yeah, a good question. I know, I know we, we are kind of, I know, I, it's so reluctant because I, I hate, but anyway, we'll go with one more. And then we'll I, I was thinking about the potential use value of seeing some positive elements in the films that we're talking about, for example, of the Cohen Biden, Hot, Biden Hotmans, because it seems to me that that film, because it is a Hollywood production value style film, and it will bring people who are, um, like a, a wide range of people to the theaters, that it can have some emancipatory effects considering this crisis of migration. I was reminded of just briefly when I wrote about Buena Vista Social Club, it that film really bothers me because it's a total colonial gaze on Cuba. But it's also important to recognize that it was the first, one of the first big screen films about Cuba that was shown on US screens. And that is a, very helpful thing to do. So I wondered if you wanted to respond to either of those. No, I think that's a good point. And, and absolutely, in the case of Schlake's film, it, we don't, we don't want to throw everything out. It, it, it definitely did open discourse um, in terms of race relations within Germany, and especially with asylum seekers, which were the most part up until um, the early 90s, weren't often discussed in, in public narratives or even um, in newspapers and public media. So in that way, I think this, this is a very productive film. Um, also, it, while Ultima was filmed to be a feature film, it didn't do well in the box office, but it did do well in the International um, um, Film Festival. In fact, in uh, 2000, in Vancouver, um, Ultima won the Diversity and Spirit Award. So there was a discourse that was brought internationally based on this film and an awareness of um, Germany's particular situation, especially after reunification of um, peop asylum seekers, immigrants that were there, um, and, I th and in other interviews that Schlake gave, he showed that from the, the time that he first conceived of this project until when he was able to film it, much had changed, especially for the conditions for many of asylum seekers in um, what was formerly West Germany, now reunified Germany. So I th Jennifer, I think you're absolutely right. There is, this, this, there is a very productive value in opening this dialogue, but it's also worthwhile uh, making sure that we're, we're not reinforcing a colonial gaze and, and that dominant view over and over and over again. So 
me. I'm just going to claim the very last word here. <laughs> um, uh, it just as we wrap things up, um, to revisit this topic of the utopian, I'm just thinking about Sherry's comment about um, how, in fact, the, the film does depict existing realities. And um, my sense of the utopian nature of the film has to do with the fact that I, in a sense, when you set out to make this film, uh, you were not getting the financing, and as it's like this idea of utopia as the definition of no place anywhere, like the funding isn't there, and you made it happen anyway. And that to me is utopian, is that you made it happen. And um, we're all, I think, in this room incredibly grateful that you did. So thank you. <laughs> and thank you to our two speakers as well for, for our film panel. So we're going to try to reconvene at roughly, approximately 11. Um, we still have food and chia pudding out um, on the buffet for you. I hope you'll have a chance to take.